Hello, welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. This is Japan, 1945 the present, part two. More baseball, sushi, and Disneyland's. In this episode, we are actually going to talk about baseball, sushi, and Disneyland's. And so, to baseball. So, when we left off, we were talking about Americanization as a solution to a problem. And how the rebuilding of Japan, with Japanese support, involved a lot of westernization, which was already happening in the 19th century, but especially Americanization, taking on American concepts, American cultural concepts. This was kind of uh, encouraged slash enforced by the American occupation. Uh, and encouraged by the economic ties during the 20th century. So, but what we'll see is how deep this cultural connection goes. And we start with baseball. Um, the cultural connection to the USA is in economics without imperialism. And it's one reason why baseball is favored over football, soccer. British football, British soccer had with it and cricket especially had with it the connotations of empire. The British went, conquered places and brought their sports with them. So cricket in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, Australia, New Zealand. Rugby, especially in Australia and New Zealand. These ideas were the British brought their sports as part of their empire. That doesn't happen with the United States. It's brought as part of the cultural connection, part of that economic connection with the United States. So it's brought by missionaries, American missionaries showing up, trying to convert people, and in their off time being like, hey, let's teach you this game we know, baseball. And so Japan had baseball, American style baseball, very early. It never really goes through a cricket stage. And so very early in the Meiji Restoration is baseball. Uh, this is impacted by the American tour, which has Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig. It has the best names, the biggest names in baseball going on tour in 1934. But again, throughout the 30s. Now, remember, Japan is at war with China at this time. But the ability to see, to watch games with the, the most famous stars of America in Japan, which is 6,000 miles away, was huge in the people wanting to play baseball. And turning it from an amateur into a professional game. Uh, this is just reinforced by the American occupation from 1946 to 1951. Uh, you have half a million Americans coming in and coming out. They're going to play baseball because baseball was the American game. So you're going, you're you're going to play it. So the Japanese are going to. Hey, we need a second team. The Japanese already have an affinity for it. So it's not a big deal to get a Japanese team to play an American team because that's inevitably what's going to happen. And and so it gets reinforced again. And so it becomes professionalized. Uh, in the 1950s, Americans come and start joining the Japanese sports league. American ball players who couldn't make it in the big leagues or were retiring from the big leagues would come to Japan. And so it gave this kind of sense that Japan mattered. They could get good stars. They could get good players to play in their leagues. And it becomes the biggest sport in Japan. And until basically now, 2010 or so, um, now football, soccer, is starting to make inroads. It's, it has a professional league. Um, kind of like the South Korean Olympics, the had a spur in South Korean culture and and democracy. 
so does the World Cup that was held in South Korea and Japan in spurring the Japanese uh, soccer league. But it's still baseball. Um, they have, and they do things that make it, it is American baseball. But they do do things to make it somewhat Japanese in the stands, in the culture. And so you get male cheerleaders. Oh, let's, let's go to this. The male cheerleaders who are as much conductors. They're more conductors than they're cheerleaders in the American concept. Like Americans don't have the male cheer conductor. That's why in the notes it's cheer dash leader. They, they're a leader of a cheer. Now, when I, now we're, when I go, to a baseball game, you do get male cheerleaders, but those are fans. A guy with a big drum, a guy who will stand in front of, and you see this in college football a lot, but there's no, but male cheerleaders are, you know, not well respected despite all their gymnastics and their ability to hang out with female cheerleaders. It's, but in the stands, there will be guys who will lead cheers. But that's a very democratic. These guys should show up. And they are part of the fan group. They are part of the fandom. And they they have special seats. These guys in Japan are part of... I don't know if they're part of the team, to be honest with you. They seem to be part of the team, but I could... Uh, you know, I could be wrong in my research, but they're as much conductors for the fans, for the songs, for the dances. There are also American style female cheerleaders that look like f American football or basketball cheerleaders. They're just at a baseball game, but they look like college female cheerleaders. There's coordinated dances and songs and colors in this way. It looks very European. If you go to a European football match, there's lots of songs and hand motions and dances. Um, you wear special colors, you know, to your to your football club team, which doesn't really work in America. Um, America doesn't have songs, and you know, I've I've never been to a sporting event where, other than college, in college you get your college fight song, right? But at a professional game, you know, a New York Giants or an Eagles game, there's not, you know, Eagles, Eagles, we love you. You know, no, no. You know, if some guy started singing that, the, the things would be thrown at that guy. Um, there's something else. There's beer girls. Where in America, it's a beer dude with a with a tray. Here you have a beer girl with portable kegs filling up your beer at your seat. So. Again, same thing as an American, right? They're selling stuff in the stands. They're selling beer. They're selling food, right? But it looks very American, but takes on these Japanese versions and accents of the American concept. So it's, it's not Japanese. It's American, but with these Japanese accents on it that make it more less American or more Japanese. It's still clearly the the American model. But when you look closely, you see these differences that make it some make it more Japanese. Now that's baseball. We're gonna see Tokyo, Disneyland, and Disney Sea, how that's different. Similar and then different. So Disneyland and Disney Sea. So that's talk about Disneyland Disney movies and shorts were big in Japan they give rise to anime which is a Japanese animation um, now anime is not in this right ja anime is very Japanese Japanese stories Japanese originals it itself comes from a manga Tradition that itself goes back to the 17th century. Uh, where images and words go back even further. But the kind of comic, multiple pictures and words, this combination of pictography and language 
in a series has examples going back to the 1700s. Um, but it as an animation is influenced by Disney. It's, it's kind of the biggest uh, export of American, of American animation. Um, and it inspires, oh, we can tell our stories this way. So, um, so how does, how do we end up with a Disneyland in Tokyo? I mean, Disney is, Disneyland is like the most American thing. I mean, it is built in 1950, in the 1950s, 1954, I think it comes out, 55. And it was on television on ABC. Walt had, Walt Disney had a weekly show advertising ABC put on his advertisements, you know, this week in Disney, in Disneyland, this is what we're building. Look at Fantasyland this week. You know, it's, it is Americana. I mean, Disneyland has a ye, Main Street USA, which is a night, a town, small town America in 1900. And it's got a frontier land, which is the old West. Now, Tokyo Disneyland will have a frontier land. It's called Western Land, and we'll talk about that. But you have to remember, it's called Western Land, but for Japan, the West is China, right? If you're in, if you're in Japan, the West is always China, whereas for China, the West is always Central Asia. It's always those nomads. So it's not the American West, and yet they're going to call it Western Land, as if it's their America. There's going to be a Mickey's Toontown and there's even going to be a Tomorrowland, and we see the the entrance to Tomorrowland with the, at the end of, with uh, Space Mountain, and there's a photo by Tom Bicker, and so I want to make sure I give him him credit because it's a good. I couldn't find a good photo, and I haven't been to Tokyo Disneyland. Um, I wanted to find a good photo of the entrance to Tomorrowland because Tomorrowland was very much an American concept. When it comes out in the fifties, and even in the nineteen in nineteen seventy one, when Walt Disney World opens, it was the idea that hey, we can we're going to the moon, we could go to Mars, that it, the future was American. Now, I have a lot of thoughts about what happened to that concept and hashtag boomers and whatnot, but the idea of there being a Tomorrowland and it's something to look forward to, it's a positive, is in all the American parks and also in Tokyo Land, Tokyo Disneyland. So how do we end up with a Tokyo Disneyland? Well, we have Walt's death in 1966, which left Disney, the corporation, kind of adrift. It lost kind of its engine. The movies in the seven, the late 60s and 70s weren't very good. Disney wasn't a big, I mean, we think of Disney today as one of the biggest corporations in the world. It wasn't. It was a small, it wasn't even in Hollywood. It was in Burbank. It was a small company. It had, yeah, it had those kiddie animation shows. It had a couple of TV shows um, of which Walt hosted. So he's dead now. And The 70s were bad for Disney. They didn't make money. They weren't very good. Um, and they were spending a lot of money to build Disney World, Magic Kingdom in Florida. First, they bought a lot of, they bought 43,000 acres of land. And then Walt died. And now you have all this land. What do you do with it? Well, it's swamp land. You can't really sell it and make a profit on it. So you might as well develop it. And well, what do we develop? Walt wanted to build a city. Walt was kind of done with theme parks. He wanted to build the Epcot, the future, the, you know, experimental prototype city of tomorrow. And the Disney Corporation, well, isn't going to build a city. That's, you can't do that. At least you couldn't then. And so they, they build the Magic Kingdom. They build basically a Disneyland, a bigger Disneyland, on the East Coast. But that means they need money. And just as this time comes along, so their movies aren't making any money, their theme park in Disney in California is doing fine. That's making money. But there, there's no new ideas. The company's kind of adrift. 
they have spent all this money to buy land and now build the Magic Kingdom. And so they need money. And here comes the Oriental Land Company. Now, you, you take a look at that name and you go, wow, that's got to be like a 19th century European company, right? Nope, it's a Japanese company. But it's the Oriental Land Company. And they approach with the desire to bring Disneyland to Japan. They came to America, they looked at the different theme parks, they wanted to do a big entertainment complex that didn't exist, and the number one place is Disneyland. The kind of, you know, other, they're not theme parks, they're amusement parks, we have roller coasters and such, and you, if you've ever gone to Japan, you know, or ever watched like, the greatest roller coasters in the world, you know Japanese people are going to take roller coaster parks to new heights but this company wanted to do something big but also very american and the the best in the world was disneyland so they go and they make entre entreaties and negotiate and the result is that they license Disney IP, basically. They make a deal where they will own the, the, the product. They will own the park. But they will license all of the intellectual property from Disney. In, the, in exchange of which, Disney gets control over what they build. So basically, the idea is um, you'll license the IP but it has to come out of Disney Imagineering. So it's got to be a Disney theme. Basically, we have to approve it as quote-unquote Disney. Like, if we're going to let Disney be on the other side of the world, we're not going to let it be Japanified. We're not... You have to kind of take what we've got. Which is fine. It, that's exactly what the Oriental Land Company wants. And they will build a near exact replica of Walt Disney World. You take a look. I've got a picture on the video. You take a look at that. That is Cinderella's Castle. You cannot tell that from Disney World in Florida. You look at that picture. You can't know if that's Disney World or Tokyo Disneyland. They look the same. You have to really know the differences to know which one that is. So you get the same Cinderella Castle. You get the same Haunted Mansion. Now, if you took my, if you listen to the Shanghai Disneyland in the China episode, you know that they changed it. They made it Phantom Manor or, or uh, it's Phantom Manor is definitely France. But it's, they changed it because the culture doesn't think of ghosts as bad. Japan doesn't either. Japan has the same ancestor worship China does. Doesn't matter. They are going to build the same haunted mansion, despite those cultural differences, as Florida. And in fact, looks the same. Which means it looks like a mansion on the New York Hudson River Valley. So it doesn't even, it doesn't make any changes for the culture. You get the same American Old West called Western Land. You get the same Space Mountain, the pinnacle for Tomorrowland, right? Why? Because they don't want to change it. They don't want to change it for the culture. They want to bring, it was Japan bringing America to the Japanese. It is the Oriental Land Company bringing American Disneyland to the Japanese. Why? Well, so they don't have to go to America. It's 1983 when this is being built. It's still expensive to fly around the world. It's expensive now, but it's it, it's way cheaper to get on a train and go right there. So the Japanese are doing well. The economy is good and America is awesome. Right? We've been talking about Japan's love of America this isn't half to a third of this course, two thirds of this course, but it's far away. It's strange. It is very big. And let's also face it. Americans are Anglo-European. 
they think of themselves as white people. They think of themselves as Anglo. They think of themselves as European, not Asian. And so while, yes, the United States is a Pacific power and has lots of connections to Asia, culturally, we look to Europe. And so while Japan looks at us, so Americans are, so my California wines, the wines I get from California or now from Long, Long Island when I was in my 20s from Long Island, but if I buy a good California wine, I'm buying a California wine that's trying to be a French wine. But I wouldn't buy a French whiskey or a Swiss whiskey. But in my aisle, I've got a Japanese whiskey. So I have a, you know, whiskey is Kentucky. Whiskey is literally, I think whiskey is, is it bourbon? Either whiskey, maybe it's bourbon. One of them is literally has to be from Kentucky. And, but the Japanese are trying to make a version of our drink, whiskey. So you could get a very nice Japanese whiskey. In fact, they became older age, kind of like we'll talk about sushi. They became older age for rich people. My stockbroker brother would get it and give it as gifts. Not the same bottle. I mean, he'd, he'd buy them for his bosses and his, people who gave gifts for, you know, his clients would give him and get him. Ah, oh, Japanese. It's exotic. It's expensive. It's very good. And it's rare. You don't. You know, most if you're going to drink a whiskey, you're going to have you know your your Jack Daniel, your your Kentucky stuff, your Appalachia stuff, and here's this this you know small batch. You know, you might get Irish whiskeys. That's true too. You know, but it's America's not as receptive to Japanese culture. Not in 1983. Remember, it's 1983. 2020 is different, but. 1983, Japan's the enemy, right? My grandparents were still alive. Who both fought against the Japanese. One, you know, well, my grandfather went to Germany, but he's, his brother went to Japan. Right? My grandmother worked in factories that built things, that bombed Japan. So Japan was the enemy. And in, 19, in the 1980s, Japan was taking American jobs. Japan was the number two economy. Japan was the economic threat. Japan was making America feel weak and fat and lazy. That's 1983. 2020 is very different. And you could see that with all the anime movies that have come out. With how suddenly uh, Studio Ghibli is huge. You know, that wasn't the case in 1983. So it's a way of bringing America to Japan. It's a safe space to dip into American culture without being swallowed by it. Yeah, there's the idea that, yeah, you could fly to L.A. And then what? You're going to then fly to New York? That's five hours. It's a long way. And then do what? Like, how are you going to see America? You're going to take a train? American trains aren't as good as Japanese trains. And everybody speaks English and nobody speaks Japanese. And there's no outside of Los Angeles and, and San Francisco. There's no good cohesive Japanese communities. You can't go to Kansas and you'd have to look to find them. Right. So here is Tokyo Disneyland and you now have a safe space to indulge in Americanization. Kind of the way Epcot works. Epcot's World Showcase does for Americans. You can go and you can try French. And you could speak Italian to an Italian waiter. And your Italian is terrible. But they'll laugh and they're nice to you. And it's a way of trying on the clothes of Americanization. Without having to absorb it. Without having to be stuck in it. So, it's massively popular. It's so popular, it needs a second gate. A second second theme park. Almost quick, very quickly. It's very clear there's going to have to be a second theme park. 
and it becomes the model for Disneyland expansions into Europe, which fails, but also into Hong Kong and Shanghai, which are still seeing how it goes. Now, Disney will own more of those and ends up owning Europe entirely, Euro Disneyland, which is now Disneyland Paris. But um, they have a local, they have a contract with a local company. They use the IP. The Disney Imagineering is is in charge. And, and, you know, it becomes this model. But the idea was, for Japan, it wanted to bring, it didn't want to change. It didn't want to Jap- Japanify Disneyland. It wanted Disney World, Disneyland, as it as American as it could be. So we get the World Bazaar. That instead of this nostalgia for the U.S. small town, which of course Japanese don't know, they've never been to you know rural Kansas. You know, there's the it's based on the Crystal Palace World Fair of 1851. So notice here, here, here they are. Here are the Americans being like, we have to change it because of the weather, right? And we'll make it a world's fair. But the Oriental Land Company wants Disneyland. Disneyland doesn't have a world's fair. They don't want to change it. So you've got this kind of American small town as an example of a, of the expo for a world's fair of 1851, which is British. So again, Disney Imagineers, when they're thinking... They think European. Now the idea is there's there's the weather, so you need a roof. It snows, and so they built the roof. So the town has a roof over it, making it like the Crystal Palace. So it's an exposition space rather than a recreation of a small town. So it has the parts of Main Street USA, but it's kind of like a museum, Main Street. rather than this recreation the way it is in Disneyland or in Disney World in Florida. And it's a way of the Japanese to enter into Americana. What the Oriental Land Company, what Japan is selling is Disney World, not the Japanese take on Disneyland. Do you see what I mean? Do you see how this is different? It's an authentic, it's the best cover of a Disneyland there is. So, so it's a, they put the roof on and thus it changes the nature of what Main Street USA, no one's, you can't pretend it's a, it's a town anymore. It's now an exhibition space. So it's a museum of Americana. Which is kind of wild. But now you're Japanese being introduced, coming into this, being introduced to this museum of American culture. And now, here's the crazier part. Since Disney World has changed so much, has had so much expansions and so many changes over the last 40 years, Disneyland Tokyo is more like the original Disneyland than Disney World is. So Japanese audiences, I felt this way when I was in Paris, when I went to Disneyland Paris, that the foreign audiences are actually getting a more authentic, not more authentic, more original Disneyland than American audiences are. Because it hasn't changed as much. It's the way... um, um, Portuguese showed up in Ethiopia and said, we're Christians, we're Catholics. And the Ethiopians were Greek Orthodox going back to the Romans. And they go, the Ethiopians are like, uh, yeah, we're Christian too. And by the way, your Christianity is very different. Why'd you change? And it was Catholicism and the Pope and all these history so that by 1500, the Ethiopians actually had a more original, pure Christianity, more like the original Christianity, because it had been hermetically sealed 
by being surrounded by Islamic states, by not adapt, by not evolving the same way as European Christianity had. So that when the Portuguese show up, the Portuguese are the stranger Christians. That's kind of like being an American. And if you, all you know is Walt Disney World, and then you go to Disneyland, Tokyo, and walk down Main Street, you're going to see, oh, there's all these shops that no longer exist. The movie theater actually shows movies. You know, that kind of thing. Now, Disneyland is so popular, you end up with Disney Sea, which is the on the other hand. Disney Sea is the Japanese take on Disney World. Now it starts the same way, but it's not that the Orient they needed a second gate. And the problem was was California Land, California Adventure failed in Anaheim. Californians didn't want a park about California. They could go there. And foreigners weren't impressed by it. So the kind of Tokyo Disneyland idea of we'll give you California didn't work. And because that failed, it ended the plans for a coastal park that was supposed to be in like Long Beach. There wasn't the money for it. And so what happened is, is all those plans basically got picked up by the Oriental Land Company. They said, well, we'll take it. We need a second park and we'll build this. And it's Japan takes the best of American engineering. And so they build on these plans. But Disney Sea is like nothing else. It's like no other Disney World, Disneyland, Disney World, no other Magic Kingdom. It is completely different. It's connected by water. It's a bunch of different islands. Its entire plan is different from any other land in on any other Disney park. And it makes sense, right? The Japanese are seagoing. Japanese pirates, Japanese trade, Japan, Japan's an island. And so here's this, this, this different lands, a Venetian land, a Little Mermaid land, an Arabian land. And it's full of new stuff, new rides, new technologies, a new way of doing things. Meanwhile, the American parks are increasingly stuck with nostalgia. They increasingly can't change. And so with Disney Sea, which lots of fans of, of Disney World type places, Disney Lands and Disney Worlds, a lot of Disney fans think it's the best park. It's the it's clearly the best park. It's the most different. It's it has the best rides. It it out Disney's Disney. And what does this show? It shows that the newest rides and shows are going to be in the Asian parks and then brought to the USA, which is the opposite of 1983. It's cultural export back to America of American culture. And this is where we're going to see video games or anime or electronics. It's this idea that this thing starts in America, is brought to Japan, their Japan, Japanese refigure it to make it work for them, and then they export it back. In some ways, it's like the British invasion of rock and roll in the 60s. The Beatles and the uh, Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin, the Who, the, the and all, a lot of little littler bands. But the idea was, that's American blues, it's American rock and roll, that they're selling back to Americans by way of Britain. And so instead of taking wholesale something American and giving it to the Japanese. They're taking American concepts and expanding on them. And then the best stuff, the Americans are taking back. So the Little Mermaid ride is starts in Disneyland Tokyo and then it's brought to America. And so it's a place where Disney can, can, ex can experiment because the, 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 the Japanese aren't as tied to American nostalgia. They didn't grow up watching, the like boomers did, Walt Disney on television. They didn't take their kids and then their grandkids and then maybe their great-grandkids to Disneyland the first time. Or 
you know, that one trip a year or one trip every five years, the entire family will do. Like if you go to Disney World, you see the people with their their um, T-shirts of their family trees and it's an entire family reunion at Disney World, right? How many of you ended up on a senior trip to Disney World, right? And so it's tied to this nostalgia of the way it used to be. Oh, this used to be there. This used to be there. This used to be there. Well, in Japan, it's not tied to that. Because it was never Japanese in the way Disneyland was very American. It's tied. Disneyland is tied to America of the 50s. Very much. It's a very much a boomer park, even today. <sighs> and so here, here we see with Disney Sea this change. J Japanese culture is stronger than it was in 1983 when Disney Sea is built a decade, uh, 20 years later. Right? It's exporting culture back to America. It can it can take American concepts and expand upon them, which is not what it wanted to do in 1983. But 20 years later, it is. And we see this cultural expansion most clearly in sushi. How raw fish and rice took over the world. I had sushi tonight. Many of you have had sushi, lots of sushi. How did that happen? Well, it starts in the 1960s in jet travel. The 1960s in jet travel allowed more Japan to U.S. travel. Japan was expanding its business. Remember, we talked about exporting. They're coming to America. They're trying. They're copying American business, right? America in 1960, in 1965, is the richest place in the world. It is the most advanced businesses. It's the best companies. It, there's a reason why boomers are nostalgic for the 1950s and early 1960s. There's a reason why. And so if you're a Japanese company, you're going to America to try to connect, try to make deals, try to find technology, try to, try to improve your business practices. So businessmen with expense accounts are showing up on the West Coast and they want a taste of home. Sushi is a peasant dish. It's an easy to make. You put a couple things in, you put some fish, you roll it up, boom, done, cut it. You got lunch. It's a, it started as a way of preserving fish without salt. Right in in Europe, we're going to salt everything. We're going to pack everything in in salt. In Japan, they're going to pack it in rice, and it became a peasant dish, a way of eating rice and a little bit of protein, in one easy to hand, easy to hold container, or easy, or you use your chopsticks, easy to use, easy to pick up. Right. So, so as J Japanese business travel spreads to the East Coast, to the South, and then the East Coast, South because of oil, Japan is completely dependent on imports of oil. So as Japan Japanese business expands, Detroit in the nor North because of the Japanese cars, oil in the South, and then the East Coast because of finance, you know, the banks in, in New York politics in Washington sushi spreads too with these with these business groups and so what then happens is an American elite businessmen pick up on it so the Japanese come in and the Japanese they go hey well let's take you let's take you out for dinner we're gonna make a deal let's take you out for dinner we could give you a big American meal but somebody thinks or the Japanese person suggests, hey, there's a sushi place. Let's go to sushi. So somebody's thinking, and they go out for sushi. And it's awesome because sushi, good sushi, high end sushi is awesome. And so elite American businessmen go, oh, I'm going to have this because it's exotic, 
but it's also sophisticated, right? You have to know what you're ordering. And it's expensive to get real good sushi. And so sushi goes high end. It goes from a peasant food to something elite businessmen can buy and put on their expenses, make the business buy. So it's a way of showing off. So now sushi will change, right? Because now sushi has to change to from traditional Japanese sushi and sashimi to now American tastes. So you get a lot more of your shrimp tempura, right? You get a lot more. You get your your Philly sushi roll with the cheese with the cream cheese in it. Like you're not gonna have that in Japan. Like maybe you do. I don't know, but I can't imagine you do. I can't imagine if I go to a little sushi shop in the middle of you know um the port i don't know a nice little little neighborhood you know something akin to chelsea or the village or i see when i say chelsea or the village i remember back to the 90s before chelsea and the village in new york changed but a nice little neighborhood where people live in japan in tokyo i don't think they're gonna have cream cheese i would doubt they're going to have cream cheese so they're going to change so all, all, almost immediately this japanese dish which was supposed to be Jap- japanese so that you could have a taste of home if you were japanese in america is now going to change to fit american tastes but expensive american tastes well now hey let's take you out and now it becomes since american elite businessmen are doing it their middle managers, their employees are like, hey, I want to try that because if the rich are doing it, I want to try that. That's very capitalist. It's the way things work. It's how Christmas works. You know, it's how a Christmas tree. Why do you have a Christmas tree? You have a Christmas tree because Queen Victoria's hu- German husband had a Christmas tree in 1835. That's why he had one. She liked it. She got one since she liked it. The nobility in 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 England thought that was great. We're going to have one since they had one. The peasants had to have one. And so everybody's got a Christmas tree. So the American middle classes start to want it. And so sushi expands. So now you could get sushi all over the place. But it also becomes normalized. So that when I, I can get sushi from Chinese takeout places, which makes no sense. Why would a place that cooks Chinese... Americanized Chinese food because let's face it Chinese takeout is not Chinese food it's American food it's actually the original American fast food because right your general chose chicken is the same anywhere in the country and that was true a hundred years before McDonald's figured out how to do that with burgers but now it's normal there's three places in my town that sell four places that sell sell sushi. It's not high end anymore. And it's all kind of American stuff in it now. There's less fish and more of lots of other things that are more akin to the American palate. And so it, so that's why I put quote unquote sushi cuz it's not. If you went to a pure sushi place in New York, in San Francisco, in Tokyo, in Yokohama, you would get a very, you you know, your spicy tuna roll, much less your California roll, which is the, the classic in America, would be very different if it would exist at all. And so it became normalized so that ordinary people eat it. It's exotic. And that export equals success. It's exotic. It's sophisticated. Then in the 90s, it became healthy. And it's small. You could get one roll. So women could eat it. It wasn't a big steak. So that as women enter the workforce, it was something women can go and eat for a lunch, a business lunch. So they could eat and at the same time, not fall into the gendered who, how much do you eat or you're not eating? How do you keep your figure? All that kind of stuff. So it's healthy. It's small. It's exotic and sophisticated. It hits all these boxes. 
And so it expands with the health food industry of the 90s and the 2000s in the U.S. and Europe. And so it's an exportation. It's exporting Japanese peasant culture to America, which shows the Japanese cultural strength in an Americanized world. You know? And then there's the Americanization of this Japanese like the sushi burrito. Like, there's no sushi burrito in Japan, or there wasn't, you know? And so American Americans take on this Japanese peasant culture, and then they, they change the ingredients to make it more American, and then they change the entire form of it to make it more American and to inhabit. So the sushi burrito is Japanese ingredients in a Latinx, in a Hispanic form function. And that's American. And so it's an Americanization of Japanese culture making it more American. Which is what American culture does. So what are our results? Japan recovered from World War II by adopting wholesale much of American Western culture and economics. This isn't as much of a surprise. It was already doing it in, in certain ways before World War II. So this is a continuation. This is in China, where China resisted Westernization, or Korea that resisted Westernization and then takes on Western pieces and makes it domestic. In Japan, it's just vacuuming it up, hoovering it up. You know, they KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken at Christmas. It's not Japanese fried chicken, it's KFC. You get the bucket of KFC at Christmas and that is your Christmas meal. Now Christmas is Christian and Anglo right? KFC is American and Southern and yet it is a Japanese especially well to do middle classes tradition that you do KFC if you live in, in the cities you it is all over the place you have to get you can't even go into a KFC at Christmas time you gotta order ahead to make sure you will get your bucket. So, there's nothing like that in the rest of East Asia. But that was going on. That process is just new. The, the, the examples are new, but the process is 150 years old. It started with guns and factories, and now it's KFC and Disneyland. That success led to more Japan Japanization, and then the export. So, so like Disney Sea, you, you're taking these things and making it more Japanese, right? So you start with the wholesale, and then you this it's, it's successful. So then you start making it your own, and then you start exporting that Japanese culture, sushi, anime. To the rest of the world. The Japanese live action movies are worth $7 billion. Good. It's a good size. Anime is worth $19 billion. Japanese anime is two and a half times the size of Japan's Hollywood. So... There's a lot of different reasons for this, but anime is clearly Japanese in its storytelling, in its values, in its methodology, right? The animation might have started back in the day with Disney and American companies, but it is so far away from that 100 years ago of what started that it's its own thing. And it's insulting to be like, oh, Disney started Japanese. Yeah, yeah. As like a grand, great grandparent, like, okay, it's an ancestor, but it's not a direct descendant. It's, it's gone through so many Japanese permutations that it's its own Japanese thing. And that's the success. So Japan went from scary and a violent empire, the poorest of the big five, big six countries, an imperial power that conquered and raped Korea that invaded 
Manchuria and wrested it from China and then built in railroads, used slave labor, tried to destroy cultures to what is essentially a rich and peaceful and one of the most powerful cultures in the world. And they did that in a century and were destroyed in the middle of it. So Japan went from scary and violent to destroyed to rich, peaceful, and successful within a century. And that is a massive change. One person could have lived through all of that. In fact, in my lifetime, there were people who had lived that. They had lived from, they had been born slightly after 1905, and they were still alive in the 1990s to see a successful Japan. So, so that's where we're going to end in this crazy change that Japan goes through and its different cultures. I hope you enjoyed this. This is, this is one of my more different, you know, episodes. It's, it's, I'm a political historian, but this is all culture and trying to show how through culture you can see how politics and economics are changing, how people are changing. And that was the idea. So I hope you enjoyed it. Go to Disneyland Tokyo and enjoy it. Go to Shanghai and go to Hong Kong and watch some anime and eat some sushi and, you know, live, live in a large world. It's, it'll be good. So be safe. See you soon. Good luck. Stay healthy. Goodbye.